announcements? Mr. Speaker, sir, <clears throat> it is with deep regret that we have learned of the demise of four former members of Parliament. Mr. Khalid Tegali, on 6th of August, at the age of 73. Dr. Satyanan Piatam, on 22nd of August, at the age of 80. Mr. Premdat Dungu, on 21st September, at the age of 78. And Mr. Marie-Joseph Jacques Chateau de Ballion, on 25th of September, at the age of 70. Mr. Speaker, sir, Mr. Khalid Tegali was born on 11th of May, 1948, in Cupid. He attended the Chandelot Primary School in Port Louis, and then the Islamic Cultural College. In 1969, he proceeded to London to study law and was called to the bar in 1974. He entered politics in 1983, joining the MMM. He contested the 1983 general election in constituency number two, Port Louis South and Port Louis Central, under the banner of the MMM. He was elected second member for the state constituency. Mr. Tegali served only one mandate. In 1987, he retired from active politics and returned to his practice at the bar. In 1990, he was appointed senior district magistrate, in which capacity he served until 1992, when he was transferred to the state law office, where he assumed the post of principal state counsel. From 1994 to 2004, Mr. Tegali served as chairperson of the Tax Appeal Tribunal. He was appointed chairperson of the Permanent Arbitration Tribunal in 2004. The next year, he retired from service and returned to his practice at the bar with specialization in tax litigation. Mr. Speaker, sir, in 2016, Mr. Tegali was appointed chairperson of the Equal Opportunities Commission, a post which he occupied until his last breath. Mr. Tegali found time, in spite of his busy schedules, to engage in social and religious activities. He was the initiator of the Muslim Family Council of which he became the first chairperson in 1995. Mr. Speaker, sir, may I request you to kindly direct the clerk to convey the deep condolences of the Assembly to the bereaved family. Uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, it is with regret that I have uh, learned of the passing of the four previous members of this House. Therefore, I associate myself with the tribute made by the Honourable Prime Minister to late Mr. Kali Tegali, and I also request the clerk to convey condolences of the opposition to the Biri family. Honourable Members, I associate myself with the tribute paid to the memory of late Mr. Kali Tegali, former Member of Parliament by the Honourable Prime Minister and the Honourable Leader of the Opposition, and I direct the clerk to convey the deep condolences of the Assembly to the Billy family. Mr. Speaker, sir, Dr. Satyanan Piatam was born on 15th of March 1941 in Grand Gom. He attended Poudredeau Primary School and subsequently the Darwin College in Flack. In 1959, Dr. Piatam joined the Teachers Training College in Bobasa and obtained his teaching license in 1961. After his training, he worked as primary school teacher. In 1965, he proceeded to the Soviet Union to pursue university education. In 1970, he graduated 
as Master of Arts in History and International Relations from the People's Friendship College of Moscow. In his determination to quench his thirst for more knowledge, he decided to pursue further education in the Soviet Union. In 1973, he was awarded with a PhD and later became a research fellow at the Lenin Marx Research Library in Moscow. Dr. Piatam returned to Mauritius in 1974 and joined the Bujwari College to teach history and social sciences. Four years later, he became the head of the history department. He entered politics in the same year and joined the MMM. He concurrently worked as personal assistant to the Soviet Union ambassador to Mauritius until 1976. He contested the 1976 general election in constituency number nine, Flak and Bonakai, under the banner of the MMM, but was not successful. In 1977, he became the editor-in-chief of Le Militant for a period of one year. He also contested the 1982 general election in constituency number 15, La Carvian Phoenix, under the banner of the MMM-PSM Alliance. He was returned second member of, for the said constituency. In April 1983, he was appointed Minister of Labor and Industrial Relations, a portfolio which he held until August 1983. He left the MMM in 1983 to join the newly created MSM of which he was one of the founding members. He stood as a candidate for the 1983 general election in constituency number 15, La Caverne and Phoenix, under the banner of the MSM Labour Party Alliance, but was not returned. In 1984, he was appointed part-time advisor on international relations matters at the Prime Minister's office. He concurrently held the post of Senior Research Fellow at the Mahatma Gandhi Institute. During the same period, he served as Chairperson of the Sugar Industry Labor Welfare Fund. From 1987 to 1996, he occupied the post of Ambassador of Mauritius to the United Nations. During this period, he also served as President of the African Ambassadors Group he was chairperson of the United Nations Population Fund Committee in 1991. Mr. Speaker, sir, Dr. Piatam was a renowned senior historian who has written hundreds of articles and books on Mauritian history and international relations. Mr. Speaker, sir, may I request you to kindly direct the clerk to convey the deep condolences of the assembly to the bereaved family. The Speaker, sir, I again associate myself with the tribute made by the Honorable Prime Minister to late Dr. Pietam. May I also request the clerk to convey the condolences of the opposition to the bereaved family. I remember I associate myself with the tribute paid to the memory of late Dr. Satyanan Pietam, former member of parliament by the Honorable Prime Minister and the Honorable Leader of Opposition and I direct the clock to convey the deep condolences of the assembly to the bereaved family. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, sir, Mr. Premdet Dungu was born on 23rd October 1943 in Triolet. He attended the Daniswok Siuraz Government School and the New College of Port Louis and the, Port and the Port Louis High School. He was later awarded a diploma in cooperatives by Daume University of Benin. In 1966, Mr. Dungu showed an interest in politics by joining the PMSD. He contested the 1970 by-election in the constituency of Pamplemousse and Triolet, but was unsuccessful. <clears throat> in 1972, 
He took employment as a Hindi teacher in a primary school. From 1974 to 1976, he held the post of inspector at the Development Works Corporation. In the 1976 general election, which he contested under the banner of the Independence Party in constituency number 11, Vieux Grand Port Roosevelt, he was returned as third member. From March 1977 to December 1981, he held the post of Parliamentary Secretary for the Ministry of Power, Fuel and Energy. In 1982, Mr. Dungo ran for the general election in constituency number six, Grand Bay and Poutre d'Or, under the banner of l'Alliance Nationale, but was not elected. In 1984, he occupied the position of Plant and Transport Coordinator at the Development Works Corporation. He contested the 1987 general election in constituency number six, Grand Bay and Poutre d'Or, under the banner of Mouvement Travail Socialiste, but, once, but was once more unsuccessful. In the same year, Mr. Dungu joined the Dresswell Knits Textile Industry as Chief Executive Officer. Mr. Dungu ran for the 1995 general election in constituency number six, Grand Bien Poudo, under the banner of Mouvement Militant Socialiste Mauritien, but was not returned. Mr. Dungu was once more unsuccessful in the 1998 by election in constituency number nine, Flak and Bonacueil. Mr. Dungu made a last attempt in 2005 general election in constituency number five, Pamplemousse and Triolet, under the banner of Top Damaka Vrai Rouge, but was not returned. Mr. Dungu served as ambassador from February 2007 to August 2011 in Ethiopia, and from January 2012 to January 2015 in Malaysia. Mr. Dungu was also known as a social worker. Mr. Speaker, sir, may I request you to kindly direct the clerk to convey the deep condolences of the assembly to the bereaved family. Speaker, sir, I once again associate myself with the tribute made by the Honorable Prime Minister to late Mr. Prem Dungu May I also request a clerk to convey the condolences of the opposition to the Bereaved family. Honourable Member, I associate myself with the tribute paid to the memory of late Mr. Prem Dungu, former Member of Parliament by the Honourable Prime Minister and Honourable Leader of Opposition, and I direct the clerk to convey the deep condolences of the Assembly to the Bereaved family. Mr. Speaker, sir. Mr. Marie-Joseph Jacques Chateau de Ballon was born on 3rd of April 1951 in Roseville. After his secondary education, he went on to tertiary education and was awarded a diploma in accounting by the London Chamber of Commerce. He later took employment in the sugar industry where he had a fulfilling career as accountant. Since his very young age, he had a passion for politics. He chose to join the PMSD. In 1987, he contested the general election in constituency number 19, Stanley and Rosil, a region where he grew up. However, he was not returned. In 1991, he contested the 1991 general election under the banner of the Labour Party PMSD Alliance, but was not elected. At some point in time, he left the PMSD and joined the Labour Party. In 1995, he contested the general election under the banner of the Labour Party and MMM Alliance and was elected second member. 1996, Mr. Chateau de Ballion was appointed junior minister at the Ministry of Finance. 
In July 1997, after the departure of the MMM from the government, he was appointed Minister of Tourism and Leisure, which portfolio he held until September 2000. He did not contest the 2000 general election and took employment at the Circus Advertising as Administrative Director. In 2006, he was appointed Ambassador in France with accreditation to Italy, Portugal, Spain, as well as the Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie and UNESCO, a post which he occupied until 2014. Mr. Speaker, sir, Mr. Jacques Chateau de Ballion wrote a book entitled Le Coeur de Solange, dedicated to his mother, whom he lost when he was only six years old, and to his family. Mr. Speaker, sir, may I request you to kindly direct the clerk to convey the deep condolences of the Assembly to the bereaved family. Mr. Speaker, sir, I associate myself with the tribute made by the Honorable Prime Minister to, Mr. to late Mr. Jacques Chateau de Ballion, with whom I had the occasion to work closely for a number of years. May I request a clerk to convey the condolences of the opposition to the bereaved family? I remember I associate myself with the tribute paid to the memory of late Mr. Jacques Chateau de Ballion, former member of parliament, the Honorable Prime Minister, and the Honorable Leader of Opposition, and I direct the clerk to convey the deep condolences of the Assembly to the Bureau family. Papers, papers have been laid. Questions? Leader of the opposition. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, today's PNQ is addressed to Dr. the Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Whether in regard to the COVID-19 pandemic in Mauritius, he will state the number of A, PCR tests affected by his ministry, on the local population since 1st August 2021 to date, indicating the number thereof found positive. B, fully vaccinated persons have it died from COVID-19 and those admitted to public hospitals indicating which vaccine had been administered to them. And C, COVID-19 positive persons have been died and where the cause of death has been attributed to some other comorbidity. Mr. Speaker, sir, I wish to seize this opportunity to thank the Honorable Leader of the Opposition for giving me yet another occasion to enlighten the House and the whole population in relation to COVID-19 situation. This PNQ will give me the opportunity to provide information and all actions taken by my ministry as well as the government since the closing of borders, partial resumption of economic activities, vaccination, and finally opening of borders as from 1st of October 2021. Mr. Speaker, sir, I also wish to express my sincere condolences to the families of victims of the COVID-19. I wish to put on record the unflinching support and involvement of the Honourable Prime Minister since the onset of the pandemic. In fact, the Honourable Prime Minister has himself been chairing the daily meetings of the high-level committee on COVID-19 set up since January 2020 to take stock of the situation worldwide and in Mauritius and take decisions on important measures to be implemented to curb the proliferation of the virus in Mauritius. Mr. Speaker, sir, the House will be glad to know that more than 280 meetings of the high-level committee under the chairmanship of the Prime Minister have been held on a nearly daily basis since the beginning of the pandemic. Mr. Speaker, sir, in reply to part A of the question, the number of PCR tests from 1st October to 24th October 2021 in the community from incoming Mauritian passengers and from private clinic stands at 47,855 and are as follows. Central Health Laboratory, 5,868. Airport Laboratory, 25,212. Nova Lab, 6,327. 
welkin 11,819. The number found positive from 1st October to 24th October 2021 in the community stands at 1,738. Uh, 1, Mr. Speaker, sir, in the beginning of the pandemic, the strategy was to contain the virus by preventing its spread in the community. Thus, random testing was being done routinely to detect the presence of the virus. Upon detection of any positive case, contact tracing was established, contacts were identified, and kept in quarantine centers. Moreover, targeted testing was also being carried out in regions or localities with several positive cases, where, where several positive cases were reported. Mr. Speaker, sir, we have reached now a point where vaccination against COVID-19 is on the solution. In fact, it is the game changer, thanks to the prompt actions taken to procure vaccines and the population who responded positively to the vaccination campaign, within a short lapse of time, we have been able to vaccinate a large number of our adult population. Mr. Speaker, sir, our the House is aware. Our original target as per the vaccination and deployment plan was to vaccinate 60% of the adult population by the end of September 2021. We have achieved this target well ahead, and 60% of the adult population had been vaccinated by mid-August 2021. Given the high percentage of vaccination achieved, the country has been able to open its borders in phases, and as from 1st October 2021, the country is open to the world. In fact, on the first day of opening of our borders, the rate of vaccination was 64.2%, more than the targeted 60%. Mr. Speaker, sir, let me now give some clarifications regarding the rapid antigen test. We have already fully vaccinated more than the targeted 60% of our population and have reached 67% of the population fully vaccinated. Several regulations have been promulgated to ensure various sanitary measures to be taken to prevent further spread of the disease. We are no longer in 2020. As everyone is aware, in 2020, the recommendation of WHO was testing, testing, and testing. However, in 2021, the recommendation of the WHO and international community is vaccination. Mr. Speaker, sir, with the successful vaccination campaign, we have moved from the strategy of containment and we are now focusing on providing treatment and care to symptomatic cases. We have moved from quarantine to isolation. These actions are scientific based and with the evidence of all our experience we had. Allow me, Mr. Speaker, sir, to inform the House that for the same period, that is from 1st October 20, uh, 2021 to 4, 24th October 2021, my ministry has effected 44,838 rapid antigen tests, out of which 12,000 have been found positive. Mr. Speaker, sir, in line with the WHO recommendations and gui uh, guidance on diagnostic testing for SARS-CoV-2, I quote, while recommended response activities are the same for probable and confirmed cases, testing of probable cases where resources allow is useful so since it can exclude cases and reduce the burden required for isolation and contact tracing, end of quote. Mr. Speaker, sir, rapid, the rapid testing has been effected on asymptomatic persons attending the flu clinic and hospital for other treatment and procedures. And positive persons of rapid test have been advised to self-isolate under the monitoring uh, of doctors of the domiciliary monitoring unit. I wish to inform the House that following the phasing out of the quarantine centers, my ministry enlisted the services of 34 medical practitioners of the DMU on a four month contract basis to effect domiciliary visit to patients tested positive in isolation. 
The DMU has started its operation since 2nd September 2021. Mr. Speaker, so the transmissibility rate of persons tested positive with rapid antigen test is very low. In fact, 98% of persons tested positive with ART are asymptomatic. The question, hence, the question of treatment or recovery of these persons does not arise. Mr. Speaker, sir, with regard to part B of the question, the number of fully vaccinated persons having died of COVID-19 from October 1st to 24th October 2021 stands at 16. Among those, 15 were fully vaccinated and tested COVID-19 positive and were admitted to public hospitals. Two were admitted at Victoria Hospital, one at the SSRN Hospital, one at Bruno Chong Flak Hospital, and 11 at ENT Hospital. No fully vaccinated COVID-19 positive patient was admitted at the Nehru Hospital and Dr. A.G. G2 Hospital. As the House is aware, Mauritius benefited from donations or from procured vaccines such as Sinopharm, Covishield, Covaxin, AstraZeneca, Sputnik V, Johnson & Johnson, and Pfizer-BioNTech. In the interest of time, I am tabling the list of fully vaccinated persons having died from COVID-19 from 1st October to 24th October 2021, and the number of persons fully vaccinated are and have been admitted to public hospitals with the specific vaccines administered to them. Mr. Speaker, sir, with regard to part C of the question, since 1st October 2021, to date, there have been 47 persons who had been tested positive to COVID-19, but whose death is attributed to other comorbidities. In fact, the cause of death of these persons is as follows. Cancer patient, three. Cardiac patient, 17. Diabetes, six. Hypertension, two. Skull fracture, one. Renal disease, 16. Cervical mass, one. Mr. Speaker, sir, I make an earnest appeal to the House to understand and appreciate the paradigm shift this government has made in the management of the COVID-19 pandemic from containment to from containment of infection to a successfully, successful vaccination program and to a new normal under a, under a constant surveillance system ranging from prevention to treatment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, um, first, I'd like to ask the Minister, the number of PCR tests he has done averaged about 200 tests per day, 244 tests per day in October. This compares to about 5,000 to 6,000 tests that the ministry was doing in, I'm talking only about local communities because the minister gave lots of other figures. I'm talking about local communities. Local communities, you were doing 5,000 tests at least in July. You've reduced this to 250 only per day. Why is that? Yes, Mr. Speaker. The reason is clear, Mr. Speaker, sir. I pointed out how the vaccination is the solution for COVID-19. Obviously, we have reached a vaccination target of more than 60, 65%. And we have also seen how many PCR tests we have been conducted since, as you rightly pointed out, 5,000, 6,000 uh, tests been done. Uh, we have patients, we have, you know, people been quarantined and all of those tests being done, the majority, should I not say 100% of the tests, were negative. Obviously, the government has to focus on vaccination, and vaccination has bring that result, and that we have the results now that vaccination, what it has, it has changed everything, from testing to now focusing on those who are not tested to focusing on those who are symptomatic. This is the paradigm shift. This is what I want to explain to the whole population, and I have been explaining it on a weekly basis on the, uh, on the uh, press briefing of the National Communication Center. The Minister has given us a figure of 1,738 positive cases out of the PCR test. Why is this figure not published? 
PCR test of uh, seven. Yes, this TPCR test is being published. All PCR tests, Mr. Speaker, sir, are being published. Our, this is being, or we always uh, publish the PCR test, the confirmed PCR test. They are all the tests that is being published. There are hundreds of discrepancies between what has been published by the Ministry for October and the figure that he has just given to this House. Is he aware of that? It is easily calculable, calculated. There are hundreds of people who do not show up from one list to the other. Yet, it is produced every day by your ministry. Mr. Speaker, sir, I'll take the first part of the question is that all PCR positive tests, be it from the private lab, Welkin, Nova Lab, be it from the airport being tested positive, be it from the conduits from the Central Health Laboratory, they are all being communicated by the proper communicating channel. I invite the Honourable Leader of Opposition to give me the figures and then we will compare. He publishes this every day and this figure shows, for instance, Saturday 23rd, 74 people. This figure, as what he's saying, includes everyone. The labs, the airport, everyone. Yet, the figure that you've given for only local community is far higher than the figure that you've given for October. I won't fight with the figures. You check it and you come back later. Please, because this is not right. You must tell everything to the House. Mr. Speaker, now let me come to rapid antigen tests. 12,000 people in Mauritius have been tested positive by rapid antigen tests since October. Now, we know that 99% accuracy of rapid antigen tests. Why is a 12,000 figure not published anywhere by the ministry and not included in this 1.32% of population infected that is again published by your ministry every day? Why do you exclude the 12,000 positive persons tested by rapid antigen tests? Uh, Mr. Speaker, so I'll, I'll again come back with the, uh, the data has been published. The information is that Be Safe Mauritius includes PCR tests, not antigen tests, and not Welkin and private and airport lab. The Ministry of Health have his publication in the government information system. This there where you get the right figures. This is the first part of the question. Now, about the rapid antigen test, I explained it clearly. The rapid antigen tests, they are all 98% are asymptomatic cases. We have, to focus, we have to focus on symptomatic cases. This has been, not only for Mauritius, this has been the practice of many other countries. Even in the future, we will reach a, you, you will reach a point where we will not even publish the vaccination, the number of people being vaccinated. We are not going to publish the number of cases detected, but we will keep on publishing the number, the details for the death. We have to make that shift, and we know very well. Rapid antigen tests being posted, uh, tested positive, they are asymptomatic pers uh, persons. They re don't require any treatment. They've been staying at home, and they have no intervention. Mr. Speaker, sir, this is a reality of being tested positive. Should we ask the question, why we are having rapid antigen tests positive and without symptoms? The answer is vaccination. Vaccination yes, has allowed us to reach at this point. And this is what every world country is willing to achieve. Every country is willing to achieve vaccination so that to protect the population. This is the final result. The final result whether a country is not, uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, let me complete, I'll complete it in half, uh, in 30 seconds. This is the answer for rapid antigen test. Now, if this country would not have vaccinated the population, if this country would not have put all the measures of precaution, sanitary measures of precautions, all the rapid antigen tests, there would have been many rapid antigen tests turned out to be positive on PCR tests and being symptomatic the situation would be completely different. This is a paradigm shift, and this is the way forward.
Speaker. Like the Minister, to be gracious, we are sitting after three months, the population is dying to have some information. Please try to, to be succinct in your replies. I maintain the figure, Mr. Speaker, said that this figure includes all the tests and not just, what the, not just the local tests. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, if that is the case, that you don't believe in showing how many people have been infected, why does this bottom here mislead the population? by saying percentage of the population affected 1.32%, that when we know that for the only month of October, you have excluded 12,000 people from that. Because it says percentage of the population affected, not percentage of the population symptomatic. You see what I mean, Mr. Minister? So you're misleading. You, your ministry, is misleading the House with this figure. Change it, because we don't believe it. It is inaccurate from what you have said yourself. Mr. Speaker, my, now, Mr. Mr. Speaker, this is my question. This is a fact. This is my question. I've asked you the question. Can you ask this stupid, this guy to stop interrupting? <laughs> stupid is uh, parliamentary, uh, I believe. It was used last time. Leader, the Prime Minister used it last time. Position. You will remember. Honorable Leader of the Opposition, I've been patient with you. Okay. After a reply, you make a statement. But I, I must... it on two occasions. Yes and you, be, you come with your question, and it's still you want to... What do you want Please, to do? He, I am being interrupted. Question. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask the Honourable Minister. My question is very clear. It asks how many people died, how many people were admitted to hospital, was being fully vaccinated. Now, this is not the reply that you have given, Mr. Minister. Honourable Minister, you have only given the figure of the people who died. That is not the question that I asked. Mr. Speaker, sir, the leader of opposition again is only coming to put questions on figures. I will again reiterate my answers. They are based on facts. They are based on scientific evidence. And what he calls infected, that's what we are in fact reporting. Patients who are not infected, I will just give you an example. Someone tested rapid antigen positive and being called to self-isolate. We do the testing around because the family members, they all have to, be, to stay at home because the fam one family member is tested positive. And in nearly all the cases, the infectability, that is the transmissibility from someone who is tested with rapid antigen positive to the other members of the family or to the, you know, to the, the place of work is negligible. And we have to stand. We have to admit. I believe that he will understand that we have to admit. How do we reach this? It is the vaccination. Because now nearly 90% of adult population is, vaccination, is vaccinated. Vaccination, what has it? It has Everyone now is protected, have immunity, and obviously that doesn't give the real picture. Mr. Speaker, sir, my question to the House is, should we only have the number of cases reported, or it is very important to give the number of cases admitted, the number of cases being symptomatic, the number of cases being in ICU, and the number of cases been, uh, the number of deaths reported. The Minister of Health believes that these are the important figures, and we should not dilute these important figures. We are giving the right, we are going in the right direction and giving the important figures, and not just diluting it in the figures. Remind the Honourable Minister that today itself, yesterday also, people who went to the rapid antigen test came home or sent home and died. So that is also important to tell us how many positives there are in the rapid antigen test. And you Mr. just have to refer to the families of people who have died in the last few days at home, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask the Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, should I, I, don't, be, I don't be have, given uh, the opportunity to reply no, on no, this I question? No, Mr. Wait Speaker, sir, I have the right to answer to this. If the leader of the opposition how the name of the patient who has gone to a, uh, to a t testing centre sent back home, this is clearly a medical negligence, and I invite him, and in, invite him to come with a, a complaint to the Minister of Health. 
you have to come with a complaint because this is a medical negligence. I agree with you. I totally agree with you. If someone yeah. has reached a COVID testing center yeah. and sent back home and passed away at home, I'm inviting him that to give that in writing, and I will definitely conduct. Uh, I, I will uh, instruct my ministry to conduct whatever be the procedures for uh, 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 for a case of alleged medical negligence. There is, uh, there is oh, ne there. medical negligence, and that it should be reported to you. Oh, That's yes, a good yes, sign. Yes, yes. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask the Honourable Minister, this is again shows up here in terms of people dying, having been vaccinated. Sinopharm is top of the list. It's not so surprising because many Mauritians have had Sinopharm. But I would expect the rest of the figures from the Honourable Minister in due course, according to my question. Now, I'd like to ask the Honourable Minister whether he's aware whether well, is aware of studies done by Columbia University, many studies, that have shown that Sinopharm as a vaccine is far less effective, sometimes three or four times less effective than AstraZeneca. And therefore, Mr. Speaker, I'd like him to, 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 uh, to say whether he's aware of that and why, why now the third dose that is being offered to Sinopharm uh, vaccinated persons is again Sinopharm and where they shouldn't do as many other countries provide another vaccine to Sinopharm uh, vaccinated persons. Mr. Speaker, sir, the decision to do a third dose is obviously uh, the decision that the vaccination campaign has to be ongoing because vaccines, I'm not going to point out which vaccine does what, but at the same time, I'm going to point out that every vaccine have a life cycle. A vaccine will produce an immunity and that immunity, you know, with time is going to fade away. Now, this is the job of the vaccination committee to decide because they are experts. They are experts who are going to guide the ministry on the way forward on the vaccination. The leader of opposition knows very well how it is so difficult to get the vaccines. And we have to be thankful to China, to the Republic of China, who at this testing point of time, how we have been allowed to procure the vaccines, to get the vaccines and in donations. The, uh, universe, the, the report that you are saying about any studies, that any studies will, will come on time, and we can't rely on one study, on Columbia University's study. That has to be, let's look for the different studies will come up. And now this study have been done with one group of population. We don't know what are the details, how many vaccines have been done. Let time tell us whether which vaccine, vaccination we have to, to, to along, the, you know, along, with, uh, along with time, we have to go for another vaccination. But now, Mr. Speaker, sir, it's very wrong to criticize a country and one vaccination and that, that a country that has provided us a vaccine at this point of time. And now we are going to tell that this vaccination is not good. That is, I think that Mr. Speaker says that has to be kept in record. This vaccination, we have to be thankful that vaccination has protected our population. In fact, the majority of the population have been vaccinated with the vaccine. And we still, with the vaccination committee, we, we know that we have to do a booster dose with the vaccination that will provide additional and will provide a booster immunity. What the Honourable Minister is saying that beggars are going to be choosers. I am tabling the report, the study, from the, from the Columbia University. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to come to ENT Hospital, where there have been many, many deaths. Half of these are not reported. What I want to ask the Honourable Minister, whether he's aware that despite the hundreds of tens of deaths at least every month at ENT, there is no mortuary, and bodies are left in the corridor without any dignity, and one body of a Rodrigan was even left four days in a plastic bag in the corridor of ENT Hospital. Well, I ask the Honourable Minister whether he cannot organise rapidly for a mortuary to be, in, to be set up at ENT Hospital. Mr. Speaker, sir, I'll take, back, I'll take this word again, burgers are not choosers. I believe 
Mauritius has been putting all the efforts to get the vaccination, like so many countries been doing so, and we were fortunate that due to our bilateral diplomatic relationship with countries, we have been able to secure vaccines, and that was the message of the leader of the opposition for us, for our people to get vac vaccinated is beggars or not choosers. Now, I will come back to that ENT. Mr. Speaker, sir, they, uh, I'll just briefly, uh, because I know me, uh, the leader of the opposition will come up to ENT. ENT has been dedicated as a facility for patients in a critical care since March 2021 till 1st September 2021, and, patient, and the number of patients admitted and discharged from Order. ENT. Order. Order, please. Mr. Order. Speaker, sir, please continue. I am replying to questions addressed to me on ENT and the facilities and the success at ENT. Let me give that answer, and then if the leader of opposition is not agreeable, I will give more, more, more clear, uh, more, uh, uh, yes. Now, the patient discharged from ENT hospital being cured from March 2021 to 1st September is 97.6%. Now, since September 2021, I have to inform the population that only patients requiring six to eight liters of oxygen per minute and who is in spite of this uh, oxygen flow do not have satisfactory concentration of oxygen in their blood are admitted to ENT. And in spite of their critical situation, the recovery rate, the recovery rate at ENT is 60.3% as compared to 64% in Europe and 42% in Saudi Arabia. And over here, I wish to again uh, send my gratitude, send uh, my uh, congratulations to the staff of the ENT for the good work they are doing. Now concerning the mortuary, Mr. Speaker, sir, COVID-19 is not something that we have learned. We have a lot of experience and that we know everything out of it. I, am, I agree with the leader of the opposition. At times it happened that there are lateness, there are delays in managing death or any other you know, that situation that may arise with, with uh, dealing with COVID-19 death. But the, mini, the ministry has kept on improving, you know, kept on improving the facilities made available. And I believe that since, uh, the, since the last one or a little bit more, we don't have any issues on the mortuary service at ENT hospital. I'd like to ask sir, Mr. It's a very important question. The fact that he didn't pre-order for the vaccines is why we have today to deal with Sinopharm, etc. I'd like to ask this question concerning, this is a very important question, maybe the most important, Mr. Speaker. A drug called tocilizumab. Tocilizumab was approved by WHO on the 5th of July. It is only a few days ago, mid-October, that the ministry has issued an international tender to buy this tocilizumab, which is obviously very effective against COVID. So why the four months delay in providing Mauritians with this much needed medicine? And why, Mr. Speaker, malnupiravir, which is about to be approved and extremely effective against COVID, why malnupiravir has not been pre-ordered, just like the vaccines, has not yet been pre-ordered by the Ministry of Health to save hundreds of lives in Mauritius. Mr. Speaker, sir, I did not know the leader of opposition is also a great, you know, have a lot of, uh, is a professor in treating medical cases. But thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, sir. I'll invite him that he form part of the medical team at ENT. Now, first I'll come back to the pre-order, the pre-order. I think that repeatedly we have been answering questions of pre-order. I'm not going to lose the uh, assembly's time over here. Now, the second part of the question is on that medication, what he has just uh, mentioned. There is the second PQ is coming on that medication. I will be replying it, unless you want me to reply it now. 
this APQ on Remdesivir yeah, and that's yeah, Now, unless you give me, Mr. Speaker, sir, I'll reply. Yes, doctor. Let the minister find his way. Mr. Speaker, sir, so I'll give you the answer for that question also. I was, I was expecting that this question, I can reply it on the second question, because it will come, obviously, but now uh, your request, I will reply to it now. Now, Mr. Speaker, sir, the, yes, I'll give you the, in September 2021, the Clinical Biological Group has recommended the procurement of tocilizumab injections and eventually remdesivir for the patient. The inclusion of this medication is by the Clinical, uh, biological, the clinical biological Group. We stand by the recommendation of those doctors who are working at ENT, who are doing their, uh, they have, they do the recommendation. It's not the ministry. It's not the minister, obviously. It's not the leader of the opposition, obviously. We stand guided by the doctors. It's not the, the doctors who have been treating COVID cases since last year and their recommendation. They have, if the ministry, when they do the recommendation and the ministry doesn't make available those medications, I will be, you know, I will be the first one. You'd give me that blame, I will take that blame. But if that clinical biological group is recommending in September and the ministry is doing all the uh, procedures to acquire this medication, which has already been given to patients, this we have to stand guided by the by that group of experts, group of doctors. Time over by four minutes. <coughs> Prime Minister. B903. Step up. No conversation. Mr. On both sides. Both sides. I was just informing him. <laughs> okay, Mr. Mr. Speaker, sir, the House will be aware that on Monday, 25th February 2019, Bush went to a request from the United Nations General Assembly. The International Court of Justice gave an advisory opinion on the legal consequences of the separation of the Chagos Archipelago from Mauritius in 1965. In its advisory opinion, the International Court of Justice made it clear that the Chagos Archipelago is and has always been an integral part of the territory of Mauritius. In view of the illegal excision of the Chagos Archipelago from Mauritius in 1965, the court concluded that the decolonization process of Mauritius was not lawfully completed upon its accession to independence in 1968. The court accordingly determined that the United Kingdom is under an obligation to bring to an end its administration of the Chagos Archipelago as rapidly as possible, and that all member states are under an obligation to cooperate with the United Nations in order to complete the decolonization of Mauritius. On Wednesday, 22nd of May 2019, the United Nations General Assembly, adopted by an overwhelming majority of 116 votes to six, Resolution 73-295, in which it fully endorsed the findings of the International Court of Justice. In that resolution, the General Assembly reaffirmed that the Chagos Archipelago forms an integral part of the territory of Mauritius and demanded the United Kingdom to withdraw its colonial administration from the Chagos Archipelago unconditionally within a period of no more than six months. That is by Friday, 22nd of November, 2019. The United Kingdom failed to meet 
that deadline. In Resolution 73-295, the General Assembly also called upon the United Nations and all its specialized agencies, as well as all other international, regional, and intergovernmental organizations to recognize that the Chagos Archipelago forms an integral part of the territory of Mauritius to support the decolonization of Mauritius as rapidly as possible and to refrain from impeding that process by recognizing or giving effect to any measure taken by or on behalf of the so-called British Indian Ocean Territory. Mr. Speaker, sir, more recently, on Thursday, 28th of January, 2021, the Special Chamber of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea gave a judgment in the case brought by Mauritius against Maldives for the delimitation of the maritime boundary between the two states in the Chagos Archipelago region. In its judgment, the Special Chamber overruled all the preliminary objections raised by Maldives to its jurisdiction. In so doing, it confirmed the undisputed sovereignty of Mauritius over the Chagos Archipelago. The Special Chamber further held as follows. A, the determinations made by the International Court of Justice in its advisory opinion of Monday, 25th February 2019, have legal effect and clear impl implications for the legal status of the Chagos Archipelago. B, the United Kingdom's continued claim to sovereignty over the Chagos Archipelago is contrary to the determinations made by the International Court of Justice that the detachment of the Chagos Archipelago by the United Kingdom from Mauritius was unlawful and that the United Kingdom's continued administration of the Chagos Archipelago constitutes an unlawful act of a continuing character. C, the fact that the time limit of Friday, 22nd November 2019, set by the UN General Assembly for the withdrawal of the United Kingdom's administration from the Chagos Archipelago has passed without the United Kingdom complying with that demand further strengthens the Special Chamber's finding that the United Kingdom's claim to sovereignty over the Chagos Archipelago is contrary to the authoritative determinations made in the advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice. D, while the process of decolonization of Mauritius has yet to be completed, the sovereignty of Mauritius over the Chagos Archipelago can be inferred from the determinations of the International Court of Justice. E, the continued claim of the United Kingdom to sovereignty over the Chagos Archipelago cannot be considered anything more than a mere assertion, and such assertion does not prove the existence of a dispute. And F, Mauritius is to be regarded as the coastal state in respect of the Chagos Archipelago. Mr. Speaker, sir, the United Nations and some of its specialized agencies have taken measures with a view to implementing United Nations General Assembly Resolution 73-295. With regard to the United Nations itself, it made a formal change in February 2020 to its official map to clearly show the Chagos Archipelago as part of the territory of Mauritius. The Food and Agriculture Organization, 
which is a specialized agency of the United Nations, has taken steps to implement the General Assembly Resolution by updating its maps as well as its databases and, rel and relevant country files. It has also rejected an instrument from the United Kingdom for accession to the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission, a regional organization falling under its purview as it was premised on the so-called British Indian Ocean Territory. On Tuesday, 24th of August, 2021, the Universal Postal Union, which is another specialized agency of the United Nations, adopted by a majority of 77 votes to six, with 41 abstentions, a resolution to implement United Nations General Assembly Resolution 73-295. The resolution provides that, A, the Universal Postal Union formally acknowledges that, for the purposes of its activities, the Chagos Archipelago forms an integral part of the territory of Mauritius. B, the International Bureau of the Universal Postal Union should request Mauritius to keep the Universal Postal Union regularly informed of any decisions regarding international postal operations in the Chagos Archipelago including any authorizations to maintain the operation of international mail processing centers by foreign entities in the Chagos Archipelago. C, the International Bureau of the Universal Postal Union should cease the registration, distribution, and forwarding <coughs> of any and all postage stamps issued by the so-called British Indian Ocean Territory. D, the International Bureau of the Universal Postal Union should ensure that Universal Postal Union documentation does not include any references to the so-called British Indian Ocean Territory or to the Chagos Archipelago as part of the member country of the Universal Postal Union, known as the Overseas Territories of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. <clears throat> and E, the International Bureau should take any other measures deemed necessary to ensure due implementation of UN General Assembly Resolution 73-295. Mr. Speaker, sir, following representations made by Mauritius to the European Commission about the reference to the so-called British Indian Ocean Territory in the Trade and Cooperation Agreement with the United Kingdom and the European Union signed in December 2020, following Brexit, the European Union has adopted a declaration to the effect that it will interpret and implement that reference in full respect of applicable international law. Mr. Speaker, sir, with all these developments, it is crystal clear that there is a growing recognition that as a matter of international law, Mauritius is the only state lawfully entitled to exercise sovereignty and sovereign rights over the Chagos Archipelago and its maritime zones, and that the United Kingdom's continued claim of sovereignty over the Chagos Archipelago is a mere assertion. The so-called British Indian Ocean Territory which the United Kingdom purported to create by illegally excising the Chagos Archipelago from the territory of Mauritius prior to its accession to independence is an illegal entity. The government of Mauritius 
is deeply disappointed and concerned that the United Kingdom continues to adopt a stand which disregards the advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice, the UN General Assembly Resolution 73-295, and the judgment of the Special Chamber of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. The United Kingdom's position is in stark contrast with its avowed commitment to the rule of law and its claim that it is a long-standing supporter of international courts and a staunch defender of human rights institutions and norms. Mr. Speaker, sir, Mauritius has conveyed on various occasions publicly as well as to the United Kingdom and the United States that it has no objection to the continued use of Diego Garcia as a defense facility. <clears throat> In this regard, Mauritius stands ready to enter into a long-term arrangement with the United States or with the United States and the United Kingdom in respect of Diego Garcia. In view of these assurances, the security concerns expressed by the United Kingdom and the United States cannot justify the continued illegal occupation of the Chagos Archipelago by the United Kingdom. I would like to once again urge the United Kingdom to bring itself into compliance with international law and terminate forthwith its unlawful colonial administration of the Chagos Archipelago. Mr. Speaker, sir, <clears throat> Pursuant to the government program 2020-2024, government will continue to pursue all avenues, whether at the political, legal, or diplomatic level, for the completion of our decolonization process, so that Mauritius can effectively and fully exercise its sovereignty over the entirety of its territory, including the Chagos Archipelago and the Mauritian citizens of Chagosian origin can fulfill their legitimate aspiration to return to the Chagos Archipelago. In this context, government will take further action to ensure the implementation of UN General Assembly Resolution 73-295 by other international and regional organizations. I take this opportunity to reiterate our deep appreciation to all countries which continue to support the long-standing struggle of Mauritius to complete its decolonization process. I also express our appreciation to our external lawyers and the team of officials who continue to be vigilant on this issue. The Chair is advised that PQ 908, B908, B910, B914, 915, 916 have been withdrawn. Honorable Tour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. Can the Honorable Prime Minister reveal which six members of the Universal Postal Union voted against the resolution which was adopted by the organization last August? Well, out, Mr. Speaker, sir, out of the uh, 124 members of the Universal Postal Union which participated in the vote on the resolution relating to the implementation of the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 73-295, six voted against. Now, these six members include five of the United Nations member states which had voted against the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 73-295, namely Australia, Hungary, Israel, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Now, the other vote that was cast against the resolution 
was from the UK overseas territories, which are collectively a member of the Universal Postal Union. I think it is also worth noting that uh, initially Maldives had voted against the resolution at the United Nations General Assembly, and in this instance, Maldives did not post participate in the vote on the resolution of the United on the Universal Postal Union. Can the Honourable Prime Minister advise what action has Mauritius taken at the level of the Indian Ocean Tunia Commission with, with regard to the implementation of UN General Assembly Resolution 73 slash 295? Yes, Mr. Speaker, sir, I, I think uh, it is worth pointing that, uh, again, as a follow-up to the resolution of the United Nations General Assembly, in fact, asking all the agencies of the UN, including all the other international organizations, to implement the uh, resolution, so we have uh, tabled uh, a motion before the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission. Uh, I won't go into the, the details of uh, what has happened. Uh, I can only say that because of the COVID situation, the uh, meetings have not been able to be held as used to be, that is physically. And uh, therefore, uh, the matter has been put on the agenda. Uh, and has been postponed uh, so that I think it is uh, more appropriate uh, when we are able to meet physically so that we will be able to explain our stand to all the member states and uh, of course there and then be able then to uh, see that we are able to uh, have a majority of members on our side to vote on, on this issue. The table has been advised that PQ B907 has been withdrawn. Thank you. There is a new president and a new Secretary of State in the United, United States of America, and even more recently, a new Foreign Secretary in the UK. Can I ask the Honorable Prime Minister whether we have manage to establish contacts with the President and Secretary of State of the United States and the new Foreign Secretary of the UK? Well, Mr. Speaker, it depends what the Honourable Member means by establish contact. Now, I, I can just say what Mauritius, what I have done. Of course, as soon as the new President uh, has been the, the President Biden has been elected. I uh, sent him a letter of congratulations. And of course, in that letter, I also mentioned uh, uh, about the issue of the Chagos Archipelago. And then, of course, when he was uh, sworn in as President, I again uh, congratulated him. And uh, I also raised the issue uh, of the Chagos Archipelago. But we have these are the only communications that I've been able to, to send to, to the actual President of the United uh, States. There has been no uh, verbal contact. Uh, we, we hope, we are, we are asking, uh, we have asked for, for uh, both uh, the US and the UK, more so the UK, because as, as, you, as we know, the, the stand of the US has always been that this is a matter between you, Mauritius, and the UK, and that you have to, to, to deal with the UK, and that the US has been systematically saying that they recognize the BIOT, that sovereignty is with the UK, and so on and so forth. So uh, I have also uh, written to the uh, uh, Prime Minister of UK, and uh, now that I will be attending the uh, summit in Glasgow, I have also requested for a meeting uh, with the Prime Minister. So, well, let's see. 
whether they, they will respond to our request. Honourable Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. Can the Honourable Prime Minister enlighten the House as to the rejection of the UK's instrument of accession to the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission by the Food and Agriculture Organization? Yes, Mr. Speaker, sir. The, uh, in fact, when uh, the UK uh, exited from the European Union, so they had to, uh, uh, you know, of course they had to come up with a new uh, agreement, uh, but they had submitted also in 2020 a new instrument of accession to the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission because initially they were represented by the European Union. So since the instrument of, uh, of, of accession, the UK claimed membership uh, of the IOTC as a coastal state. That is because what they have been saying is because of the British Indian Ocean Territory. And as I say, because of the resolution that was adopted by the General Assembly, the FAO had rejected that instrument of accession. So now they have submitted another instrument of accession to the FAO so that they could join the IOTC as a distant water fishing nation. So, well, that is the situation right now. Ms. Can I ask concerning the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission? Can I ask for confirmation that, in fact, the UK used to apply for membership as a coastal state, which it can no longer do, but as the Honorable Prime Minister said, they are now applying as a fishing nation. Because is the Prime Minister aware that the rules of the Indian Ocean Commission allow countries who are not a coastal state, who are not in the Indian Ocean, but who have one or more ships fishing in the Indian Ocean, the rules of the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission allow such a country, therefore the UK, to apply for membership. And what are we doing about that? I am very well aware about that. These are the rules of the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission. What we are objecting is that the UK cannot justify its admission based on the fact that the British Indian Ocean uh, Territory is part of the uh, territory of the UK. This now cannot stand because of the advisory opinion, because of the General Assembly resolution, and I think more so because of this uh, uh, judgment of the Tribunal of the Law of the Sea. So that we are strongly objecting. But of course we will see how the uh, uh, UK will, will apply for the membership. Uh, we will have to look at the, the rules and what are the criteria that has been laid down for them to be able to accede to, to membership. You still have the question? Merci, Monsieur le Président. Le Premier ministre a, en plusieurs occasions, annoncé une visite sur l'archipel, y compris uh, Diego Garcia, avec les Chagossiens et d'autres dignitaires au plan national et international. Pourrait-on savoir de quoi il en est sur le projet Est-ce que un navire a déjà été uh, affrété à ce sujet, à cet effet Merci. Let, let, me, let me say, and I try to be as brief as I can, Mr. Speaker, sir. Since the announcement of this visit, I, I, I say it as, as I think it should be said. We have been uh, threatened. Let me put it that way. We have been threatened by the United Kingdom and the United States not to undertake any visit to any of the islands of the Chagos Archipelago. I have stated publicly that on one occasion, the former U.S. ambassador met me specially on this issue and said in 
very clear terms that should you wish to have a boat to go there, your boat will, will be sacked before it ever reaches any of the island of the Chagos. But then, of course, I think if, if the House will remember, the, the, the U.S. ambassador tried to clarify to say that, well, it was misunderstood. I, I don't misunderstand such things, uh, Mr. Speaker, sir. But anyway, this is, this is the issue. But anyway, I can say that I am determined. Mauritius, we are determined. Anyway, on this side of the house, we are determined to continue the fight so that we regain our territory. And, and I must say it is not easy also to, we don't have a, a ship of our own to be able to go to the, any of the island of the Chagos archipelago. We, we need to uh, charter a ship uh, and, you know, because of COVID and so on, so it has been very difficult. But we are, we are trying our best and I, and I hope this will, will, will happen at some time in the future. The table is advised that PQB904 has been withdrawn. Time, one minute. So let me call it time is over. <laughs> question, you've already withdrawn your question. Yes, yeah, 30 minutes gone. Question to other ministers. The table has been advised that PQB952 will be replied by the Honorable Minister of Land Transport and Light Rail, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Regional Integration and International Trade. PQB957 will be replied by the Honorable Minister of Arts and Culture, Cultural Heritage. PQB938, 939, 949-958, 977-979, 959-960-961-962, 963, 964, and B992 have been withdrawn. B918. Mr. Speaker, sir, with regard to Brexit, Mauritius signed an economic partnership agreement with the UK in the eastern and southern African configuration on 31st of January 2019 to prevent trade disruption and to ensure the continuity of trade. This agreement is operational as from the 1st of January this year. We have included a rendezvous clause in the EPA for future engagement and issues not covered as of now, such as trade in services, investment, intellectual property rights, among others. We will agree jointly with the ESA Group and the UK on the appropriate time to start, negotiating, to start negotiations on these issues. Now that the UK is not a member of the European Union, Mauritius and UK can, if there is mutual interest, engage in negotiations on issues that were under the competence of the European Commission, such as on fisheries, for example. However, there is no obligation to do so because of Brexit. With regard to the international driving license for citizens of Mauritius to be able to drive in the UK, can the Honourable Minister advise where matters stand? Um, I understand, uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, firstly, that it is the Commissioner of Police who is the competent authority uh, to issue and, to, and, to, and for the delivery by him of international certificates of motor vehicles and driving permits. Uh, <clears throat> with regard to the ex uh, question asked by the Honourable Member, I am given to understand that inter international licenses are still valid for the UK, same as uh, they, are <clears throat> they were valid for European countries 
with whom we have made uh, the necessary arrangement. Next question. Oh, B919, please. Before we come to driving in the UK, let's go to the more important issue of visa and immigration process. Uh, have we assessed the impact of Brexit of Mauritian in general traveling to the UK and more specifically Mauritian students studying in UK universities and who will study in UK universities in terms of visa and immigration process? Uh, may, I, may I request the Honourable Member, Mr. Speaker, so if you can come with a substantive question, I could give him, give him the, the, the answer. Number two. B191, sorry, B919. Mr. Speaker, sir, with regard to part A of the question, I'm informed by the Mauritius Judo Federation that its managing committee is composed of 11 members from 16 affiliated clubs at the time of election, which was held on 26 January 2019. Subsequently, a total of 28 managing committee meetings have been held. I am tabling the composition of the present managing committee and the status of its office bearers. I'm also informed by the Federation that its annual general assembly, initially scheduled for March 2020, could not be held due to the COVID-19 pandemic and that a fresh date will be fixed shortly. Mr. Speaker, sir, as regards to part B of the question, I'm informed by the Mauritius Judo Federation that as at date, only 14 clubs forming part of five regional sports committees are affiliated. I am tabling a list thereof. According to the Mauritius Judo Federation, there is no club on its waiting list for affiliation. Request for affiliation has to be made according to the affiliation form provided by the Federation. As regards part C of the question, I'm informed by the Federation that the num number of licenses for 2021 is 321. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Selon le Sports Act 2016, section 4, sous section 3, les fédérations sportives ont l'obligation d'affilier les clubs. Et selon vos informations, il y aurait 18 clubs de judo qui se sont vus refuser leur affiliation par la fédération mauricienne de judo. Oh. L'honorable le, le, ministre pourrait-il euh, s'enquérir pourquoi la FMJ refuse ces demandes et de voir comment ces demandes d'affiliation peuvent être reconsidérées afin qu'ils puissent eux aussi bénéficier des facilités de la Fédération mauricienne de judo euh, Certainement, Monsieur le Président. Donc, euh, au niveau du ministère, nous avons déjà de toutes les façons reçu plusieurs lettres. Il y a plusieurs, euh, il y a plusieurs clubs qui m'ont écrit personnellement. Donc là, je vois, il y a le club de Cassis. Donc, Monsieur... Mike Munawa. Donc, il y a, il y a au moins plusieurs, plusieurs clubs qui m'ont écrit et donc j'ai déjà donné la responsabilité à mes officiers de vérifier et de voir euh, qu'est-ce qui s'est passé par rapport à la demande d'affiliation. Et je tiens à ajouter aussi que euh, c'est valable pour tous les sportifs, pour tous les, les, les entraîneurs, pour tous les clubs. Si quelque part ils se sentent lésés, euh, ils peuvent aussi faire une complainte euh, au bureau de l'Ombudsperson, qui lui, c'est son travail qui va suivre personnellement euh, les, les différentes complètes qui vont être logées. Donc j'inviterai les, les, les clubs qui ont des difficultés avec la fédération euh, d'aller vers l'Ombudsperson pour faire leur complète officielle et de sorte à ce qu'on puisse trouver une solution. Concernant justement l'affiliation des clubs de judo, le ministre peut-il nous dire s'il est informé que le secrétariat de la, fédération, de la fédération, qui se trouve à Grande-Rivière, refuse systématiquement de prendre possession des enveloppes envoyées par la Poste concernant les demandes d'affiliation des clubs. Euh, J'ai fait demander une petite enquête à ce sujet. Euh, donc, 
d'après ce qui m'a été rapporté, c'est que les lettres qui arrivent de Dieu, bien souvent, euh, il n'y a aucun membre ou secrétaire administratif de la fédération qui sont présents et qui pourraient réceptionner ces différentes lettres. D'où le retour à l'envoyeur, comme on dit, de ces, de ces différentes lettres de, de demande. Euh, mais, euh, comme je l'ai dit, donc je demande à, à ces différents clubs d'aller vers le ombudsperson et si besoin est, si le problème, euh, on n'arrive pas à trouver une solution, donc si besoin est, euh, j'appellerai une réunion avec les différents clubs qui n'ont pas eu leur affiliation et je demanderai la présence de l'honorable Tour dans cette réunion euh, pour qu'on puisse trouver une solution ensemble Alors, et, et avec le président de la fédération pour qu'on puisse discuter autour d'une table et voir où est-ce que la communication ne passe pas de sorte à ce que la fédération pourrait au plus vite euh, enregistrer ces différents clubs qui font leurs demandes. The table has been advised that PQ B973, PQ B980, PQ B981 and PQ B982 have been withdrawn. Honorable members, I suspend the sitting for one and a half hours.